Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, good evening, Mr. Ajipera. Yes, very clear. Very clear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me thank you all and uh, welcome you all to the webinar. This is our second webinar in our series. So we have been very careful in selecting topics and timings for our webinars. And uh, today's webinar is on a timely topic, you know, topic on discussion, non-traditional strategies for sourcing and logistics. In this kind of times, times in challenging periods, times in crisis. Let me describe a little bit about the Institute of Supply and Materials Management, ISMM, established in some October, way back in 1972. ISMM is the leading professional organization in supply chain management, fostering professional development of purchasing and supply chain management in Sri Lanka. ISMM is a member organization of Professional Association of Sri Lanka as well as the Federation of International Federation of Purchasing and Supply Management, in which uh, we have got about 50 countries, 50 nation, national bodies comprising more than 250,000 professional members. We are also a recognized organization under Treasury and Vocational Education Commission of Sri Lanka. Having a brief introduction to ISMM, I hope uh, I don't have to elaborate on the disciplines of this kind of webinars. Nowadays, everybody is very familiar. Still, I would like to request uh, everybody to keep the mics muted unless otherwise you are required. And if you have any questions, if you want to ask any questions, please place your questions in the chat. So we will be going through the chat and picking your questions when it comes to the last half an hour of the webinar to answer your questions. We have a small agenda. In a crisis time, what so logistics strategies should be implemented will be addressed by Mr. Ruan Vaidhiratna and also sourcing strategies by Mr. Tusis, Tusit Gunavardhana Surya. Then we have a panel discussion. Mr. Ganesh and Mr. Ifram Ghazali is taking part. So they are in the panel discussion. Finally, the vote of thanks by Mr. Jayanta Garlehava. So let me in welcome you all again to the session. And let me introduce Mr. Ruan Vaidhi Ratna, Managing Director of Haley's Advantage, appointed a director to a subsidiary company in 1996, and the Deputy Managing Director of Haley's Advantage group in 2010, and finally group management committee in February 2011, appointed as the managing director, Haley's Advantage group. Former chairman of uh, Ceylon Association of Shipping Agents, CASA, and also former chairman of the Sri Lanka Logistics and Freight Forwarders Association. Mr. Paide Ratna is a member of Steering Committee on Port, Shipping, Aviation and Logistics affiliated to the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. He's a member of the National Agenda Committee on Logistics and Transport of Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. He holds an MBA from Edith Coburn University of Western Australia and has undergone many executive development programs with National University of Singapore and also Indian Schools of Business Management and INSEAD, University of INSEAD, France. Mr. Ruan Vaidhiratna, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Good evening, 
ladies and gentlemen uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to uh, address you all on this uh, very pertinent uh, topic um, my uh, presentation will cover the areas of um, uh, the uh, impact of the covid virus and then i will switch over to uh, talk about supply chain move to ocean freight air freight and then third party logistics and thereafter i will talk about how we as a company as an organization overcame some of the challenges during the pandemic and talk a little about the future of logistics so to begin with i think i would like you all to hear out this quote from a great general from the united states uh, general eisenhower who became the 34th president of the united states he said you will not find it difficult to prove that battles campaigns and even wars have been won or lost primarily because of logistics so during the war time logistics was a very important activity but in more recent times i think logistics was forgotten they were talking about imports exports and logistics was given a back seat i believe till the covid pandemic broke down when actually the covid hit the world people realized how important logistics was because not imports not exports nothing moved without logistics happening so i think people began to realize how important logistics is so we as practitioners i think should be proud of the fact that uh, we play a very very vital role and people now see the value of logistics so moving on to the impact of uh, Uh, impacts that we had during the pandemic i think there were some salient issues that we faced we saw volatility in demand and supply if you talk about vessel operations or air freight operations there were fluctuations in demand and supply very unusual demand and supply does move up and down but it moved uh, very, very uh, in a very erratic manner during the pandemic we saw demand decreasing at the beginning of the year 2020 and then uh, even supply situations fluctuated very very rapidly then we also saw the people availability we saw how as soon as these lockdowns the curfews that happen right around the world the availability of people was an issue to all supply uh, uh, practitioners of logistics because people could not move around that required numbers of people to perform logistics activities were not available as a result there was serious pressure on the system social distancing created a situation where people had to work from home there were complex procedures that we had to follow we had to limit the people that were brought down for work factories had to shut down so there was huge amount of issues in terms of uh, getting to people getting people to work 
the required numbers to perform the activities. Also, we saw a huge change in consumer buying patterns. We saw technology becoming more and more important. We saw how e-commerce suddenly activated. People who never ordered online started ordering online. People who had goods brought it in lorries and delivered it to your houses. So there were multiple new channels that were created due to this pandemic. So if you really look at it, e-commerce played a huge role. I don't have the numbers uh, uh, relating to Sri Lanka, but I'm sure you all know how people started ordering online and as, as I said, how people change their buying patterns. If you talk of the US, the retail orders increased by 146%, increasing the revenue by about 68%. That is an enormous increase. That was a huge shift in buying in the US. Online grocery shopping, they predict would double by 2021. You know how people in Sri Lanka started ordering food online. And they say that Sri Lanka, what would have happened 10 years from now happened immediately, almost immediately overnight due to the pandemic. People had to get used to ordering online and they did. Last mile deliveries became all important. As you know, in e-commerce, one of the pain points is the last mile delivery. To get the right product to the right place at the right time. So there was an enormous amount of focus on last mile delivery of companies and they expanded quite rapidly due to the increase in demand. You also saw the shift in uh, uh, sourcing patterns. You saw the US saying that they are too dependent on places like China and how they shifted sourcing to other places, places like Vietnam, Cambodia, and even Bangladesh. To reduce dependency, they looked at regional sourcing, they looked at insourcing and also near sourcing. So these are some of the shifts in supply chain that happened due to this pandemic. So if you move on to ocean freight, this is an area that we have got really challenged. If I walk you through, at the beginning of 2020, there was a huge drop in demand due to the shutdown of some of the countries. There was a huge drop in demand. As a result, the shipping lines pulled out capacity and artificially created the demand. That's because the uh, consumer demand went down and uh, there was excess capacity on ocean freight. So all what these lines had to do was to unplug capacity and dock their ships and create that artificial demand. Come July, August, when the world realized that the economic impact could be far greater than the impact of the pandemic and realized, like in Sri Lanka, that business has to go on as usual and lockdown was not the solution for this, the demand increased. As a result, the lines started in gradually introducing capacity again into the market, started operating ships that were docked, introducing them into the services. And today we have, so as I said, supply and demand is something that we have seen all the time. 
uh, during the depression, the 2008-2009 depression, we had a drop in demand. So that is something that the industry has seen. But today we are faced with a very, very unusual situation, which is unmanageable. That is, the container supply chain has completely broken down. The result, the, the reason for that is because before the pandemic, there was a lot of products pushed to places like Europe and US. And as a result of the pandemic, the consumption dropped, consumer demand dropped. So as a result, all these products that were shipped out from this part of the world to the West has got stuck in ports. People have not cleared goods. Some people have cleared the goods and are using containers as temporary storage. As a result, this whole container movement, the cycle, because as you all know, you send export cargo and get it returned with import cargo. So this is a cycle that moves and the containers get repositioned. And that's, that's the movement that happened. So this movement has completely broken down. As a result, we have a huge problem now of getting containers to for exports out of this region because all the containers are stuck in the US and in Europe. So this is something that we have never seen, not myself in my 35 years of uh, business in shipping. So here is a situation where the entire container supply chain has broken down. So there are containers stuck in hubs, like key hubs like Malaysia, Singapore, and containers not moving from big markets like US and Europe. So that's the situation as far as ocean freight is concerned. If you talk of the Colombo port, you know that we've faced some very unusual issues where a few weeks ago we had a, a backlog of about 50,000 TUs not moving between the terminals. We had about a 30% uh, drop reduction in workforce because of the pandemic. So this whole issue in the Colombo port was caused by four key situ uh, issues. One is that the backlog in places like Singapore, as I said, some of the key hubs like Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, because of the backlog created, the ships could not come in, uh, to Colombo in a sequential manner because the port of Colombo permits berthing of ships according to windows. So they are given a date and a time for them to bring their vessels in. So if they miss that window, they have an issue because there is someone else who is waiting to take the berth. So we work on windows in Colombo, berthing windows. And because of this issue in these hub ports, None of the ships came to Colombo according to the allocated window. As a result, berthing was an issue. Together with that, there were certain trade union issues in one of the private terminals, which caused more pressure for, in terms of performance. And then the biggest problem was the COVID, uh, the pandemic issue where they found a couple of people who had caught the virus and the numbers kept increasing. As a result, people had to be asked to keep away from work. So these are the main issues that cause the, the problem in the Colombo port which we are facing today. But I must say that the situation is getting better. It's improving day by day. And the, the weather situation, which we experienced a couple of days ago, did not help the situation. That too put pressure on uh, ship's uh, operations. So these are some of the issues that Colombo faced as a result of 
this whole pandemic. Air freight, another story here. Now air freight, uh, the usual situation is that 60% of capacity, 60% of air cargo is carried on the belly of passenger aircrafts. 40% is carried on dedicated freighters. Um, as a result of the pandemic and the shutdown of airports and the restriction of travel, the entire passenger belly capacity, almost the entire passenger belly capacity was taken off. As a result, there was a there was huge supply issues in terms of air freight capacity. So what the industry has done is they have converted some of these passenger aircrafts into cargo carriers, and they have been able to push up the capacity by about 28%. But that too is not enough. And as a result, we see that the air freight rates, like in the case of the ocean rates, have gone up quite rapidly. So we here again, we have a, a capacity issue as far as air freight is concerned. If you talk of 3PL, what did we see? Here again, we saw people working, forced to work from home, a complete change for people, people staying at home, placing orders online. So that was a phenomenon, uh, something different, something unusual for us, never faced before, which put pressure on people and organizations. Then, as I said, buying patterns changed. As soon as you hear of a lockdown, you saw the panic buying that happened. People used to knock on each other, knock each other's vehicles to go and make sure that they get their pound of flesh. So supermarket shelves went empty because the people who had the capacity to buy bought almost everything that was available in supermarkets. Never compassionate about the others. So that created a situation where our 3PLs had to ramp up their activities to make sure that the goods were replenished and there was no stock out situation. Regulatory issues were serious. There were PCR testing that had to be done on a random basis. Limited people were allowed to be brought into offices and most of them were asked to work from home. Some places completely locked down. So that caused more pressure on the 3PL industry because customers wanted the products on their shelves, but we had a huge, we had huge pressure to perform those duties. Pricing, you saw a situation where customers were demanding cheaper prices, saying that they have lost orders, that they are out of business, and the people who were at the receiving end were the three PLs who had to give discounts in spite of their costs, operating costs going up in carrying out PCR tests, housing people, all that. Over and above all that, we three PLs have to give discounts to clients. Manpower shortage I spoke about before. So here again, your customers want cargo on the shelves. The consumers are crying for cargo. So we had to, as 3PLs, make sure that we continue to perform our activities to keep those 
supermarkets, pharmacies replenished sufficiently well. Health and safety was paramount. It was more important than before. So we had to take all necessary precautions. There were very, very stringent conditions laid down by ourselves as an organization. Um, so there was a lot that had to be done at an extra cost to make sure that health and safety measures were given top, top priority. So how we overcame all this situation as an organization is amidst all these challenges, we, as a, one of the leading logistics providers, do some very critical operations. We are one of the leading 3PL providers for some of the multinationals, FMCG products, which had to get to the supermarkets to make sure that not only that our customers' promises were met, but as a country, we had a responsibility to make sure that the people didn't starve and that the food, the required food was on the shelves for them to consume. Pharmaceuticals was a critical product. Uh, just for your information, the Panadol that goes, that is consumed by people, all that is delivered to, to supermarkets, pharmacies, hospitals from our distribution centers. So just imagine if we were unable to deliver Panadol, what a crisis it would have been. Oxygen, another crucial product, going into hospitals, going into ICUs, helping people to stay alive. Just imagine if as a 3PL provider, we failed. People would have just died in ICUs. So that's how critical our operation was. We couldn't let our country down. We couldn't let our people down. We couldn't let our customers down. So we had to continue and we had to operate in amidst all those challenges that I spoke about uninterrupted. So we had to work very closely with the security authorities. We had to do a lot of lobbying to make logistics an essential service and to get about things. So some of the opportunities were also very interesting, some new opportunities that came by. Although there were multiple challenges, the people who were up and about found a lot of opportunities that were created amidst the pandemic. We helped um, um, multiple companies to do that last mile delivery. Uh, reefer storage was hugely in demand because there was, short, uh, there was a uh, limitation of uh, shortage of reefer storage capacity. So we converted reefer containers and help people to store refrigerated products. We converted containers. We realized that in a situation like this, mobile uh, uh, grocery stores, mobile bakeries, mobile um, banking was in demand. And so much so that we did uh, 80, a couple of ATM machines to some path bank using containers. So these are some opportunities that were that we capitalized on. And we also started moving, repatriating some people uh, from uh, uh, places like the Maldives, from Indonesia or to Indonesia, to the Philippines, helping them to get back home. So we use some of our air aviation connections to repatriate people to various locations. We also used, uh, uh, capitalized on the situation and operated cargo freighters. These are uh, passenger aircrafts where cargo was loaded even on seats and shipped out. So we moved out multiple freighters helping the uh, air freight movement to happen. 
So, in an environment like this, the most important thing is to stay connected. So, there were multiple webinars that were organized. We reached out to some industry leaders to learn and understand what the new normals were. They were talking about new normals. We didn't understand what these new normals were. So we wanted to know from multinationals, from some leading players in the industry, some tech experts, how we should really deal with this environment. And it was all important for us to stay connected with our people. So we, we can, because they were working from home, they were completely disconnected, never before. So how do you keep these people together was a huge challenge. So staying connected was through these webinars. We shared knowledge. We carried out about 5,000 hours of training online. Uh, there was a personal message that went from me personally to each and every staff member, assuring them because there is so much of doubt created, doubt about their employment, uh, doubt about losing their jobs, uh, salary cuts and so on. There were so many companies that cut salaries, retrenched people, but we gave them certain assurances that we stood by and there were regular communiques. There were even songs created, little thing, but the, the impact was so much where we got our people to, to uh, come up with a song um, developed by our own people, sung by our own people, and all the music was also done by our own people. From different locations, they connected and created this song. So there were multiple ways in which we, we, we connected with people. So um, we had uh, uh, something called an advantage living library where we got senior people to talk, uh, about, got people to reach out to our senior people, share their experiences. We shared a lot of uh, messages on uh, tips on health and safety. And uh, we appreciated some of the work who, uh, done by the people who are continuously operating amidst the pandemic. So there were multiple things done to keep people engaged. So what I'm saying is that it is absolutely necessary in an environment like this for you to engage with your people, not only with your people, your key customers. So never forget to engage with your people and your key customers. So if you talk of the future, a little bit about the future, um, as I mentioned, the major beneficiaries, the key beneficiaries were the tech companies of the e-commerce field. There was huge growth around the world in e-commerce, the space of e-commerce. And uh, if you talk of the US, I think they, are, they, are, they were forecasting 100% uh, growth in e-commerce. So, that's the level of uh, in engagement. But um, I, I wanted to show you this slide. Although we talk so much about e-commerce, still in the world, there are more negatives than positives. Although I'm saying that e-commerce is going very rapidly globally, not only globally, in the region and even in Sri Lanka, there are still issues as far as e-commerce goes, primarily due to the logistics part. You see a situation, there are multiple situations where orders are not uh, sufficiently fulfilled. You order 10 items, you will get six of them. They don't come on time. There are multiple issues. There are more negative experiences than positive experiences. So, a lot to do Mr. with Juan, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, about three more minutes. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So, and uh, uh, there are uh, less positives like um, the speed of ordering, the convenience, and all that. So, some beneficiaries, some who gained, 
was e-commerce companies like Amazon, Walmart, then uh, streaming companies like Netflix, YouTube, and uh, companies, uh, teleconferencing, which we never did before, Zoom, uh, MS Teams, and so on, food delivery, and uh, mobile gaming. The losers were aviation, restaurants, tourism and hospitality, entertainment and fashion. And if you really look at this, this is what will disrupt logistics. Some interesting areas are like in the future, you will talk about data analytics, digitalization, you will talk about data warehousing, big data and all that type of thing. You will talk about cloud logistics where there, there will be new platforms that will be created like Freightos and all that type of thing where all the freight rates are put on a platform and there are, there's bidding that goes on. Blockchain, which is already been practiced by many shipping lines and so on. Uh, robotic and automation, RPA type of thing. Um, and uh, automation, uh, autonomous vehicles, which are already being tested and used, drone deliveries that happen. Even in India, drones are used to deliver medicines. In Africa, they use it for delivery of blood samples and all. So these are new things that will disrupt the traditional logistics space. Third, uh, the 3D printing and uh, standardization, physical standardization for the internet. So this is, these are the things that will completely change the dimen dimension of the traditional logistics. So you will see startups really coming in and disrupting like Amazon is doing. Uh, they started uh, as an e-commerce company now they're going into owning aircrafts. They're looking at owning airports. So they are completely disrupting the entire um, industry. Okay, um, the other thing is that uh, uh, you will see that your customers today will be your competitors tomorrow. Your customers will get into the logistics space and start competing with you. They would realize that that needs more control. Therefore, they would buy into a smaller logistics company to cater to their logistics. So you will find that your customers will change into competitors. Then, of course, the obvious thing is uh, collaboration. There will be more and more collaboration. And uh, I suggest that everyone looks at more and more collaboration to get that scale advantage because as individuals to carry out activities would be very, very challenging. So collaboration will be, uh, will be uh, the name of the game. You see, you saw how um, in the shipping industry, how uh, mergers and acquisitions happen when shipping lines as independently couldn't operate. There was a situation, they came to a situation where as independent shipping lines, they couldn't operate. And they had to get into mergers, acquisitions, reducing the number of shipping lines to just a bare minimum. So what did they do? That again is all about collaboration and creating that scale because it will be a scale game at the end of it. So it is important uh, to not throw away collaboration because that's something that we never looked at doing. But I think it will be more and more important in the future. So finally, my uh, last slide is the supply chain for the vaccine, COVID vaccines. Uh, we have heard about the Pfizer vaccine, which uh, has to be moved at uh, minus 70. Uh, from the point of manufacturing, within 10 days, it has to be uh, used. 
And just imagine the nightmare in logistics. And as a country, are we ready? No. So there is the message I want to give you is logistics in Sri Lanka has a lot to learn, there are a lot to do, and never forget that there are the disruption, the startups that would come and really disrupt this industry. So be on top of the game. Uh, and my message to you is always expect the best. While you prepare for the worst and capitalize on what comes by. There will always be opportunities amidst all these challenges. So think out of the box and keep looking for those opportunities that will come by. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ruhamayadi Ratna, for your very informative and figures, a lot of this data, a lot of initiatives, and a lot of things that we should be doing to cope up with the new normal. Thank you very much. Let's move to uh, the next presentation. Give me a minute to share it. Okay, so the next uh, speaker is Mr. Tusit Gunavarna Surya. He will be speaking on the sourcing strategies in during disrupted times. Mr. Tusit Gunavarna Surya is currently holds the position of procurement and logistics director of INC Cement, commonly holds him. And he has served as the director of supply chain of AMAS consumers, head of supply chain at Pontera Brands, and a procurement of Dassault Smithla in Sri Lanka, and also as at MS Holdings. Having experience in manufacturing, supply chain, project management, and engineering in apparel, cement, pharmaceuticals, dairy, personal care, and home care sectors, is a key distributor to supply chain knowledge forums, both locally and internationally. He holds a BSc with honors in electrical and electronic engineering from University of Peradeniya, Masters in Business Administration from University of Colombo, MSc in Business and Organizational Psychology from University of Coventry, UK. He also has positive for many executive leadership development programs at IMD, Switzerland, and National University of Singapore. And also is a member of IEEE. And over to you to see, to talk about sourcing strategies. Thank you very much, uh, IG. I won. So, Ruan extensively spoke about the challenges that COVID has posed on the supply chain. So, I will focus on the procurement perspective and what we can do as procurement professionals. So if you look at the impact that uh, COVID has posed on the uh, supply chain, especially I can see three main impacts. Firstly, the supply chain risks have gone up. So risk mitigation has become very important. The importance of liquidity in uh, the entire supply chain has become very prominent. Then also the need uh, to reduce cost to be lean has become also very important. So these three things have become prominent. So as procurement community, as supply chain professionals, let's look at how we can address these things during this session. So even in the uh, normal context, even when uh, things are going well, you know the importance of controlling cost in the supply chain, right? So it's directly linked to 
supply chain performance which is linked to business performance so you there are a lot of companies which says even that your supply chain is your business right so when your business needs to do well you your supply chain has to perform so it is very important so in this current context the supply chain cost as a percentage of your revenue or as a percentage of sales across the industries will vary depending on the nature of the industry but it will usually range from 50% to 80% that that's the usual range that supply chain costs will be of your revenue this will be different when you take certain industries like fintech but those are exceptions where you may have a lower supply chain cost so in this context with the challenge that covid has posed what can we do so first thing that we looked at as a company is whether there's any model changes that we can do so whether there's anything that can be insourced in the current context it's because of all three reasons that i mentioned earlier the risk of supply the liquidity related reasons and also the cost because what happened is with the covid impact certain demand for certain goods went down so that gave us excess capacity so then we looked at what can be insourced from previously outsourced services to cater this now i know this is common across many industries fmcg faced the same thing some of their outsourced services were insourced during this period right so that's one of the first sourcing decisions whether there's anything that is currently outsourced that can be insourced or it can be vice versa also because if your factory for example is affected because of covid now imagine that you are in a red area or a high risk area so you can't run your factory but in that context then it might be possible to outsource that and get the production continuing so that your uh, customer service levels can continue so insourcing versus outsourcing is something that you first need to look at as soon as your supply chain is impacted with something like covid where you cannot really forecast when this is going to end or where it is going to hit next but in doing so you need to understand what are the uh, factors which will affect this decision right so if you look at what favors insourcing it's it's the relationship of the product that firm uh, where you can really focus on your co competency right but if you look at uh, the what favors outsourcing especially in the context when it's highly uncertain like in covid favors that because you can then cater uh, the demand by switching facilities or services on and off right and also the cost allocated uh, to insourcing out and outsourcing uh, some of the materials i have included in this presentation so when ismm circulates especially to its students that you can refer to them and later uh, go through this as well so the costs allocated to insourcing and outsourcing if you are moving into insourcing from outsourcing there will be a certain set of cost which you uh, see here and uh, the, if you are moving from insourcing to outsourcing again there will be certain cost right moving on now all of us are clear about different stages that sourcing has moved from purchasing uh, to procurement to strategic sourcing so what is non traditional sourcing in the time of a crisis like to highlight this particular graphic to talk about that so each one of us if you are in procurement especially you are familiar about the traditional sourcing techniques then then uh, what we call as non traditional sourcing sourcing in this context will fall into strategic sourcing e enable procurement and specially integration into supply chain so this is more about the cost of sourcing or what you call as total cost of ownership in this integration of sourcing into the supply chain into the business you are going into the arena of higher value creation you are moving from cost to value so let's look at this component strategic sourcing e enable procurement and integration into the business from a sourcing perspective how it will help you to come through something like the covid 19 created pandemic so some of the things that you need to focus on that i will talk about supplier relationships 
and expanding your supply chain supply base usually you talk about consolidation volume pooling and uh, leveraging that volume but especially in a in a covid uh, scenario like a pandemic you see how if you are dependent on a single supplier that they can be affected and it will affect your entire business as well so how do you look at your supply base then of course total cost of ownership is a very important concept and then we have seen that the digital technologies especially uh, moving from digitization into digitalization into digital transformation you have seen that now e sourcing e procurement and e commerce tools are really picked up and mr vaidyaratnam also spoke extensively about what hairy has done in this arena as well so it's common to many fact uh, many uh, companies many businesses where digital transformation has really kicked in then integrating into the supply chain so uh, earlier uh, procurement may have operated as a as a separate unit separate entity identity but in a crisis situation they need to be a core part of the business team and some of the sourcing decisions will impact your entire business as well you need to increase your supply chain visibility needs to be done anyway but especially in a context like covid where you really cannot predict or you really cannot get your demand forecast it's very important that this integration this visibility is increased especially for procurement then uh, also the application of sourcing tools into the supply chain so that your execution can happen seamlessly that needs to happen so what are the unique aspects of strategic sourcing that you need to focus on so consolidation and leveraging of purchase power now in this in this particular context of covid while there were some impact on cost there were many opportunities to bring down the cost as well especially in global commodity market so if you are dependent on global commodity market you can see that uh, from uh, the crude oil itself the commodity market went down uh, to very low levels so those are the times that you need to go in lock in volumes because you know that the only logical way that it will go up now what you have seen with the news of covid uh, vaccine and things like that the pressure uh, precious metals uh, went down as well if you look at uh, precious metals like gold silver commodity prices went down right then secondly the emphasis shifts more from cost to value in in certain scenarios because you might even have to pay a little bit more for reliability to mitigate your risks right so that's that's another important fact supply relationships needs to be meaningful in the sense that you cannot really let down your supply chain partners in a crisis now crisis is a situation where you are trying to really cut down on cost but you need to do it in a very rational way it's not about cutting or reducing the payments made to suppliers it's not about not paying the suppliers everything needs to be done in a sustainable manner so that's why it says meaningful supply relationships then processes needs to be improved especially visibility communication connectivity your systems needs to be reliable and improved and as supply chain community as procurement community you need to really enhance the teamwork and professionalism especially in a crisis situation like this because it's uncertain it's going beyond your normal vuca world and it, it's becoming really uncertain and the role that you have to play as as a procurement professional right which is a core part of the corporate strategy has multiple dimension has multiple aspects Uh, multiple characteristics or attributes as you can say so the strategic sourcing part right there are many things that you need to do so uh, basically if you look at our own case we went into all the contracts and renegotiated the entire inc procurement team each contract was renegotiated based on the changes that has happened right all spend categories were looked at risk mitigation you need to do contract management especially it's very important because now for example uh, the restrictions of the lockdowns caused by covid or and imposed by the government there was a lot of debate whether those can be used as a force measure condition 
right? But uh, in the end, the debate was whether it's an act of good or uh, the act of government. So your contracts really need to be very clearly defining what are the things, especially in uh, shipping and uh, in freight, high value contracts, freight, uh, you need to have these. These things very strong. Even on China, so and uh, India as well, which are really affected by this uh, pandemic. And then you need to look at how you can mitigate your risk by broad basing your supply chain risks. Then innovation and technology, uh, spend analysis, category management becomes a very important process because you will not be getting the normal lead times that you have during the pandemic period when it moved from China to into uh, the Europe countries like Italy, Germany. So, for example, we depend on these countries for a lot of our spare parts, including India. So, a lot of suppliers could not really predict when they could serve our orders. Right? So, uh, many industries face similar situations. So, your entire process cycle needs to be revisited, re-looked at and strengthened to make it more robust. Then, your objectives during, a this, uh, during a period such as this will definitely change they won't be your usual goals. There will be more control on cost. There will be more uh, scrutiny on everything that you purchase, everything that you source. So you need to be ready for that. Good leadership is very important from the supply chain community, from the procurement community, because your internal stakeholders, your user departments will be looking up to you to get this. While they understand these external challenges, still they only have you to come to get their requirement serves. And also an, another thing faced by many organizations is a lean organization structure. How do you optimize organizations? In certain instances, you may need to let go of people. In certain instances, you may need to get people in. Depends on the industry that you are in. Depends on your strategy, business strategy. Depend on your corporate values, etc. But you need to have the right organization so what we did is we shifted some resources from, for example, uh, different categories into categories that we wanted to focus more, like services, right? And uh, like into freight, air freight, ocean freight, because you had to pay more focus during this crisis period into those categories. So that's something that you need to do temporarily, even temporarily, you need to look at your organization and adapt to that. And within that, Cost control is, is a very important thing because uh, you need to see how you can improve your supply chain cost. So there are some key levers that we used and I would like to share them. So you first thing that you need or uh, you know already is that cost is driven by specification quantity and the unit rate. So you otherwise, if you try to negotiate, it, it just becomes Sunday fair bargaining. It's like host trading, but if you really go into a scientific approach, you need to either look at the specification, either look at the quantity and the unit. So if I'm to give an example, let's, let's take a service, for example, now, uh, for, uh, since we spoke about logistics, let's take a warehouse, a logistics service specification is, is what you have defined as your requirements, right? So here, uh, whether it's a ambient temperature, whether it's a cold storage warehouse, the flow area, etc. Then uh, quantity is again, uh, either your unit storage or it can be even a uh, flow area. Uh, it can be the number of people, it can be the working hours, right? And unit rate is what you pay for that. Now, if you look, changing the specification, it may be shifting from one warehouse, maybe a high cost one into a different uh, warehouse. That is not so high cost now that will for example, vary based on the area that you're in. Quantity, you may be using 10,000 square feet now, but given the pandemic, if you see a reduction uh, of your demand temporarily, even for a short period, you can adjust the quantity. And also you can look at whether there are any opportunities to adjust the unit rate. So these three are the three factors which drives cost. And then always focus on the TCO approach, total cost of ownership, don't look at the purchase price only, look at the TCO. And uh, the other factors, other levers that you can look at are alternative uh, sources. Now, for example, we had 
to move from china into india for certain materials and secondly whether you can do any productivity improvement right whether you can get more from the resources that you have automation is an important part because especially covid situation gives risk with the number of people that there are in and lesser the number of people you can within your facilities reduce cost to a certain extent so innovation is another thing that you can look at whether you can reengineer the supply chain to cut down the cost supplier performance management is very important in a crisis condition because suppliers sometimes if they are short of people or if they are having some restrictions on material sourcing etc they could be taking shortcuts cutting down on quality not supplying the regular specification that they are doing there were several cases that we also faced due to covid they could not get their regular supplies they had sourced from somewhere else and we had some quality concerns because of that so that is something that you need to watch out for uh, both based on supply and quality needs to be measured the strategies that you implement for your supply chain sourcing will depend specially on the quadrant that you are working on so you need to look at what are the critical supplies for you and how like i mentioned earlier what is the commodity market doing and how you can benefit from that generics probably you can give a little bit of lesser focus during a crisis period but especially high risk items even though it's low in value you will have to spend more time so uh, to get more value out of this what is recommended is this strategic sourcing methodology what is usually used in procurement as as a key tool is recommended even with a shorter life cycle to be used in the covid period covid criteria as well because especially you need to revisit steps like assessing the supply market because this has changed your internal spend profile may not have changed but definitely supply market has changed and based on that you may need to change your sourcing strategy and when you are going into this later you can refer some of the additional detail in this presentation you can look at the entire market reassess both locally domestically and internationally globally what your market is doing then moving on supplier selection uh, during a crisis period is again very important usually you go through a very uh, a strict due diligence process and then select your suppliers this is even more important during the time of a crisis now what we personally face sometimes is uh, when this crisis was happening especially since the march 20th lockdown april may where we were really hit uh, with the uh, entire country being locked down some suppliers chose to go the extra mile take the curfew pass uh, go to the police get the necessary health uh, cover from the um, phi and then they supported us to continue the operations but some other suppliers they said there's no way that they can operate given all the restrictions the additional cost they have and then uh, they just let us down so you need to be using this information in the future when you select your suppliers when you select your business partners to know who will stick with you so supplier selection during the covid uh, period the pandemic period gives you an opportunity to really know who are the people that you can depend on and who are the people that you uh, will have to let go because they are not able to be a long term part another important aspect that i had to study during this period is is this uh, supply strategy so if you are having a single sourcing strategy that's very high risk in the pandemic uh, situation but if you are having a multiple sourcing strategy that work best cross sourcing especially if you have intellectual property that you are trying to protect while outsourcing uh, could have an impact and at least you need to go for dual sourcing if not multiple sourcing so broad based in the supply chain is very important evaluation of suppliers and maintaining the relationship is again important because suppliers are having the same issues or the, facing the same issues that we are facing as well so you need to have a very close dialogue more communication than you usually do in when you are doing your business as normal but closer collaboration is important during this time 
And when you are looking at how you can reduce the cost and manage that aspect, it's important that procurement community realizes that there are certain tactical decisions that you do, certain operational decisions that you do, and there are certain strategic decisions that you need to take. So these are more focused on value where operational decisions are more on the total cost. So this is where I was telling you need to integrate with your business head, with your CEO, with your financial uh, chief financial officer as the procurement community. Sometimes it may not even be the lowest total cost of ownership, but you will need to look at the total value generated. Concept of total cost of ownership is uh, familiar to all of you. E-sourcing and pre-procurement is very important. So there are many things that you can do, analytics, uh, then uh, metadata analysis that is there now. You don't need to have your own software. You can do BI with the uh, pay and use licenses. And uh, your e-sourcing, e-procurement platforms can really be used. For example, we are using the platform with uh, SAP HANA called Ariba for RFP, RFQs, and uh, even reverse auctions and things like that. Especially in a context where it's uh, recommended not to get in touch with people and uh, where you have to reduce uh, physical meetings, e-sourcing, e-procurement tools will really help you. And there are now a lot of inexpensive tools that you don't have to spend a lot. You can use them online and uh, pay per event. So get into these tools, they will give you good value and it'll help you uh, to increase the transparency of the sourcing process during the pandemic period as well where you cannot have your usual tender processes, et cetera. Uh, so there are interrupt. those advantages, disadvantages. Five more minutes. We have got five more minutes, sorry to interrupt. Sure, uh, so supplier performance management, again, uh, critically important. You need to work with the suppliers. You need to support them. Uh, some of them may be having uh, uh, cash flow issues. So you need to work with them. If you are extending your payables, extending your payment terms, you need to work with them and uh, communicate and uh, do that together with. What you need to watch out is that when you are talking about supplier performance management, that it can have certain written, uh, hidden costs because of not, for example, quality non-compliance, or even it can be related to corporate governance or ethics, right? So while you monitor this, it's very important, especially in a, in a crisis situation, in a pandemic situation, there can be certain violations of the contract and that will have a huge value loss for you, right? But other time, other way around, if you are able to collaborate with your suppliers better, then definitely you can create more value and you can capture the opportunities that is created with this pandemic. So in summary, uh, I would like to remind that strategic sourcing in the current context of COVID and the related pandemic plays a vital role for the success of your business, for the sustainable growth of your business. And there are some key tools, key approaches, a very scientific way of looking at things and where you mitigate your risk, where you can reduce your cost and where you can really perform well, even whether it's a crisis period. What's important in managing this is to go into it knowing the subject, knowing the external conditions and having the right leadership. So I'd like to close with this slide. You may have the best tools, you may have a very good strategy, but execution is critical. Execution is very important even more important than business as usual during crisis. Sometimes you will work 24 hours, seven days a week, uh, but focus on execution, follow up on the details so that you will deliver on your sourcing strategy. Thank you very much. Over to you, IJ. Thank you, Tosit. Again, very informative with a lot of uh, facts, strategies to come back with COVID-19. So let's open the forum for questions and the answers and the panelists. So let me introduce the panelists first. Uh, we have got Mr. 
Victor Ganesh is an alumnus of the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and has obtained a postgraduate diploma in business administration from the University of Colombo. And he has undergone training at the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply UK, Hindustan Lever Training Center in Mumbai, and Unilever Training Center at four acres in UK. He is a fellow member of the Institute of Supply and Materials Management and he, having obtained corporate membership in 1991, he is a distinguished service member and distinguished service to ISMM. He became the president from 2002 to 2005 and also he represented the ISMM at several international seminars and conferences in the International Federation of Purchasing and Supply Management and he had served in many committees. Mr. Ganesh worked at Unilever Ceylon for 33 years and he ended his career at Unilever as the chief buyer and head of logistics. He has been the leader and member of several regional buying teams and global buying teams of Unilever worldwide. At the end of the Unilever career, he served as general manager of Amico Industries and served as the CEO of the now local group of companies from 2011 to 2020. Mr. has been a member of OPA Expo Forum since 2001 and has served a vice president for over four years and he was elected as the president-elect and chaired the organization, organizing committee of the 2013 annual conference on the theme human capital towards 2020. And he became the president of the OPA from 2014 to 2015. I've got another panelist. Then Mr. Ikram from Haley is advantage again. 23 years of experience in the areas of sales and marketing, operations and logistics, agency management and general management appointed as a director to the subsidiary company in 2011. Appointed a member of the group management committee of Haley's Advantage Limited, January 2015. Mr. Ikram holds an MBA from University of Wales, UK and postgraduate diploma in marketing from the Chartered Institute of Marketing, UK. Vice President of Sri Lanka, France Business Council and as an executive committee member of the Sri Lanka Maldives Business Council of the Sri Lanka Chamber of Commerce. Member of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport Sri Lanka, certified international audit directed by BVQI France. The forum is open now for questions. I would like to uh, pose a question to Mr. Ganesh first. Uh, Mr. Ganesh has uh, Mr. Ruan Vaidyaratna very clearly explain the situation of the organizations and disturbances faced by the organizations nowadays. As a result, I'm sure all the organizations are facing a cash crunch. And uh, into the future also, I don't see a positive visibility in terms of cash flow, cash inflows. Therefore, what would you think? What do you think about this cash flow management situation? And what are your suggestions into supply chain management organizations? And at the same time, for any organization going through this challenging phase of time? Mr. Ganesh, I hope the question is clear. Yeah, the way I, I hope, the way I understood, I'll answer. If I am off track, please correct me. I think you have to first internally conserve every rupee you can, cut down all the unnecessary expenses wherever possible and optimize the uh, use of the available resources in the form of cash, firstly. Secondly, nowadays, I think you can get uh, bank borrowing at fairly low rate, depending on how capable your financial people are. And uh, in the changing world, in Sri Lanka, there is this third opportunity in the CSC where they are asking most companies to register themselves uh, so that you can even have tax benefits. 
right so basically it boils down to managing the available finances at your best right and one way of doing it is uh, also in relation to sourcing you can uh, choose the products if you are in a manufacturer you don't have to continue producing everything under the challenging time choose products that gives you maximum profitability and try to reduce on the other items and maximize productivity with those few products and uh, you need to collaborate with your suppliers in order to see that you get the best cost does that uh, cover your question or hello can you hear me yes mr ganesh i i think you answered the question adequately and uh, my next question is to mr ikram uh mr ikram uh, now we understand uh, in order to understand the status quo of the organizations and if i ask you to outline the supply chain challenges that you are facing today compared to what you did during the pre covid period i hope the question is clear to say ikram uh yeah i'll try to uh answer that question in this way uh yes peak of the uh, pandemic we had uh, a, a lot of uncertainty uh, nobody knew how exactly to face the situation so uh you know it was locked down uh, we didn't know how to get our approvals we didn't know where the shortages were you know lot of uncertainty but generally what happens is organizations very quickly learn uh, from the challenges so at at our organization what we did was first to take we took stock of the situation outline the key challenges and then uh, came up with various uh, solutions to the problem so today we understand the problem therefore we are able to uh, better put out a, a, a better solution <coughs> um i hope i answered that question it was a very broad question so yes. there are i mean i maybe i could extend a little bit say today uh, your it systems were not really geared maybe 6 uh, months ago to really face your end to end solution end to end challenges maybe today companies have really geared uh, and ramped up their it infrastructure so that uh, you know you could manage with less human intervention so it has played a very big role you you understood better today what are the 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 really the challenging areas in your logistic supply chain and you have now put more focus in those areas hence um uh, the issues have been better managed today okay thank you so much uh, i think you answered the question well and uh, my next question is to mr ganesh again mr ganesh uh, now as uh, mr tusit explained and also mr van vaidratna touch on the same thing so we are basically faced with unprecedented issues with the supply bases now almost all the all the organization whether it is in sourcing or whether it is outsourcing whether it is onshoring or offshoring the suppliers are also faced with so many situations because we all are working in the same external environment which is challenging so what do you think i believe the the securing the supply base and managing the suppliers are very important at this moment what are your ideas on this and what strategies can be adapted adapted in this kind of situations to secure the supply base i hope the question is firstly, sorry i would say firstly you have to get closer to your supply source as never before in the sense you have to uh, collaborate get to know them understand their problems right and make sure that they understand your problem because earlier it would have been just you know each one minding their own business now is the time to understand each other and try to cooperate to so that it's a win win situation now if you are talking about foreign supplies maybe now you had look at alternate sources 
China may be difficult. Look at Vietnam, uh, close by countries like India, Malaysia, right? And uh, even amongst local suppliers, uh, try not to have too many suppliers because then it is not a win-win situation. Try to have few reliable suppliers and uh, give them the larger part of your cake so that they also become sustainable and uh, work on that basis. And also there's another new thing nowadays, even with competition, you can collaborate, right? We get together and work together so that we even share our supply sources and guarantee certain volume to your supplier so that he becomes an economic producer. So that the economies of scale, you as well as your competition benefits. Because at the end of the day, you are not competing with your uh, competitor on price alone. It's the product positioning that matters and each one has a niche. So it's time. I'm not saying you can collaborate with every uh, competitor, but there are some competitors with whom you can work with because the market is large, demand is there, and very often uh, supply is unable to meet the demand. Does that cover your course, uh, question or is there anything that I left out? Uh, I think you covered uh, almost everything, Mr. Ganesh. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question goes to Mr. Ruan Vaidiratna. Uh, in the logistics area, as you touch, you know, there are so many challenging uh, situations and issues that are faced with. Freight rates has gone up unprecedentedly, in certain cases, three, four times higher than the pre-COVID situation. As a result, some uh, raw material sh shipments are on hold. Manufacturers actually can't afford the cost. What do you think, uh, Mr. Ruan Vaidya Ratna, that we should be doing or the government should be doing and what strategies can be adapted to mitigate the situation? I think the question is clear. Yeah, so as I said, it, um, it is a more global situation here. Um, it's nothing to do with the local environment. Of course, the Colombo port situation aggravates a little bit more to the issue. Uh, aggravates the issue a little bit more, uh, but uh, it's a it's a, a global issue. And uh, as I mentioned, um, it is um, uh, an issue of container availability. Generally, shipping lines manage the, uh, the supply demand situation to push the rates up and down. Gen generally, to push it up when it's low. But here it is an uh, inventory issue. It's a container issue, uh, container availability issue. Uh, because most of the containers are stuck in various places due to uh, uh, people not clearing goods, due to uh, uh, the drop in, uh, that's due to drop in uh, consumption, I think. Um, this whole cycle has broken down. So now, uh, imports into Sri Lanka, people are finding it difficult to get a container to move their goods into Sri Lanka because of this container availability in this region. Uh, so I feel that uh, um, uh, it will soon get back to normal because I think there are a lot of initiatives that are being taken uh, at all ends. For example, now shipping lines have taken an initiative from the US to bring in empty containers. Generally, they would bring cargo in those containers, but consciously moving empties to reposition them in, in this region. Because if they load cargo, it, that means the cycle gets longer. So to immediately reposition, they are even bringing empty containers to this region. So there are multiple initiatives that have been taken by lines and uh, uh, the situation should improve. But as I said, uh, as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, it has just aggravated the situation here, which I mentioned is aggravated uh, 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 because of the Sri Lankan situation. So the answer to that is of course, to increase capacity. Uh, we have the East Terminal, uh, which needs to 
get operationalized as soon as possible, basically to create capacity and improve efficiency. So uh, I know for a fact that they are doing various things to push up uh, efficiency. Um, so one thing is, there are, there are two things that I could suggest. One is collaboration again, again between the terminals. All terminals, the two private terminals and the government terminal should work together to uh, reduce this uh, birthing issue, uh, try and swap vessels whenever a birth is available uh, as uh, to the best of their ability. Uh, so collaboration between terminals. And the other thing <coughs> is uh, operationalize these uh, births as soon as possible to create capacity. Thank you very much, uh, Ruan. I think uh, you answered uh, exactly the point. And uh, next question goes to Mr. Ikram. Now, there are so many cost escalations, uh, escalations taking place due to this particular issue. And uh, can you please give us a rough indication of the you know, percentages or the rates that have been increased? And also, as you think, what measures you should be taking to remain competitive? Over to you, Mr. Ikram. I think the question is clear. Yeah, I think uh, that question has two sides. One is on the freight trade side and one probably is on the material side. So I'm sure the material side answer, maybe Tusit will be able to better answer that. Uh, but on the, uh, on the freight trade side, what I see is, uh, I mean, Mr. Vaidyaratna very clearly outlined that. Uh, to slightly expand that, uh, there are about total about um, um, 25, 20 to 25 touch points in your total I'm talking of a C, C transportation side, 20 to 25 touch points. So all those touch points are today impacted. To give you an example, uh, you know, a, a shipping line would ideally turn around a container about 4.5 times a year. So right now, because of the, the bottlenecks that are prevalent in the 25 areas, a carrier could only turn around that uh, probably only about 2.5 to three times. With that, the space has, uh, uh, because carriers have pulled out capacity, uh, there is a, a, a double demand. So with those two put together, you have seen a huge spike in, in, in freight rates. So this situation is not going to continue. Uh, I saw recently an article by Lodestar saying that, uh, you know, uh, Currently, you see a huge demand running up to the Chinese New Year globally. So you, you see prices really shooting up. So we expect those, uh, uh, you know, world record prices to kind of come back and settle possibly after February. So uh, you have two sides. If you have really, really top urgent cargo to be moved, yes, you have to go through the pain of having to pay that uh, extra price uh, because you got to really get uh, space. Um, if there are orders we, you can push back in order to manage, then you hold them back. Probably uh, you go through, uh, go past the Chinese thing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ikram. I think a uh, part of the question uh, goes to Mr. Tusi in terms of material. So the question is uh, how costs are being escalated in your business area and yes, what sir. strategies you are you are adapting to be to remain competitive the okay, question is yeah. is it clear yeah the question yeah. is clear uh, so um, while we look at cost what i have seen is that there is opportunity for cost reduction as well so as an industry if you look at uh, my industry the cement industry during the pandemic period we have been able to reduce the supply chain cost by more than 15%. That's mostly coming from the commodities uh, because a lot of it is driven by energy uh, prices, the fuel uh, prices. So uh, crude oil prices went down to about $37 per uh, barrel, even if you look at uh, WTI or even red oil slightly higher. And uh, then re related to that, the coal prices came down and uh, 
petroleum or fuel derivative prices came down. So even plastics and uh, stuff, uh, things like that, packaging material prices, uh, craft paper prices uh, came down. So there was a lot of opportunity for us to go and contract at these lower prices. And uh, while, um, like Mr. Ikram said, while the container cargo freight went up, the bulk cargo, uh, whereas we are doing chartering for bulk cargo, the bulk cargo freight actually came down. The Baltic index, if you look at uh, that, you can see the dip that it has had compared to some of the peaks of last year. So we took that opportunity to rent, uh, go into the market and contract at these lower rates. So overall, it depends on your industry. It depends on the materials that you buy. But the pandemic even now has given opportunity for a lot of industries to really bring down your costs. So even in FMCG, uh, if you look at some of the key commodity markets that uh, is there, there is opportunity to go in and lock in now. While now they are starting to recover, uh, we are seeing great opportunities to get a reduction of your supply chain cost. Thank you very much uh, to see. One last question to Mr. Ruan Maidi Ratna. This is from the chat actually. So what would be the best strategy during pandemic, they should be consolidated offshore, distributed offshore, or distributed onshore, or consolidated onshore. I repeat the question. What would be the best strategy during the pandemic? One is whether it should be consolidated offshore, or distributed offshore, or distributed onshore. This is coming from Mr. Dharma Ratna from the audience. Uh, I am not very clear with this question. Uh, is it all right if I try to uh, yes, please. answer that? Uh, Mr. Please. Yeah. And I, yeah. So uh, based on this particular uh, question, wh what I can say is there's no uh, one size fits all strategy. It de really depends on your industry. It depends on your uh, organization. Now, because if you uh, look at uh, a BPO, right, anyway, which is sort of an offshore operation, then you might have to look at distributed offshore uh, if you are operating in India or some other place. But if you are in uh, in a industry which is um, looking at catering the domestic industry, then it has to be a either a distributed onshore or a, a consolidated onshore operation that you have. So, uh, basic answer to your question is there's no generic recommendation that uh, I can give from my experience. It all depends on the factors affecting your specific industry and uh, your organization. You will have to look at the context and select, select what is best for you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tosid. I think uh, the time is up now. So while thanking everybody for supporting us, contributing towards this particular webinar. I will invite uh, Mr. Jayanta Galheva for the vote of thanks. Over to Mr. Jayanta. Thank you very much, Mr. IG. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure to deliver a vote of thanks in this remarkable session. First of all, let me thank our resource personnel, Mr. Ruan Vaidratna, Managing Director, Hades Advantis, Limited and Mr. Tusi Gunawana Surya, Director, EC Limited, for their wonderful inputs, which I believe it's timely required for this, especially for the supply chain professionals in this crisis situation. Secondly, let me thank Mr. V. Ganesh, past president of OPA, as well as past president of ISMM for his valuable inputs, as well as Mr. Ikram Ghazali, Director Haley's Advantage, for his valuable thoughts. Thank you very much. The entire session was managed by our president, president of ISMM, Mr. I.G. Pereira. And especially we need to thank him on behalf, on behalf of the seminar and function committee. Special thanks goes to the members of seminar and function, as well as marketing committees, especially Mr. Sarat Gamage, Vice President of ISMM, as well as Vice President of OPA, 
Mr. Darshana Vijayman, Mr. Krishanta Prasad, and all the members of the both committees for their tireless efforts to have this event successfully. Again, special thanks should go to members of ISMM staff, Mr. Chamara, Mr. Niranjan, and all the uh, ISMM uh, staff who has given <clears throat> tremendous support to have uh, this event successfully. So I don't think I do not need to take much time and hope everyone has gained maximum out of this fruitful session. And as an ISMM, national supply chain body in Sri Lanka, so we will plan to organize much more CPD sessions with industry experts in near future as and when industry required. Thank you very much for all of you and have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much, Mr. Jayantha. So for your information, this, uh, the recording of this webinar will be placed in our website. So leisurely you can go through it and again update yourselves. And also, <coughs> when we meet another webinar, have a pleasant night and stay safe. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ajit. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. Stay safe.